is called, oh, what's it called, Rick? The French, French Connection. The French Connection, yes, yeah, about uh, influences of pulp, uh, French literature on pulp fiction. We have Rick Lee, Rick Lai, is that how I said? Lay. Rick Lay, who is the author of Chronology of Shadows, a timeline of Shadows exploits, revised complete chronology of bronze. Rick Lies, Rick Lies, right? Lays. Lays. Rick Lays, Secret Histories, Criminal Masterminds, and uh, Daring Adventurers, two, two books. Uh, he's going to tell us about how such works as Alexandra Dumas, Count of Monte Cristo, and the Man in the Iron Mask, Marcin Leblanc's Arsene, Maurice Leblanc's Arsene Lupin stories, Phantom of the Opera, Phantomos, and uh, other authors influence such writers as Lester Dent, Walter Gibson, Justin McCulley, Norval Page, and Theodore Tinsley. And he's going to look at a bunch of other works for us. Uh, so, Rick, you're on. Okay. The most influential writer on American pulps from France was Alexander Dumas, wrote in the 19th century. <clears throat> His most famous creation was the Count of Monte Cristo, whose real name was Edmond Dantes. In 1815, around the time of the Battle of Waterloo, Dantes is framed for treason by a conspiracy of four men. He gets sentenced to life imprisonment. While he's in prison, he discovers that his father has died. Now, his father was an invalid who was financially dependent on him, and his father has died from starvation. So he's got two reasons to hate the bad guys now. They put him in jail, and they've essentially caused the death of his father. So he wants to avenge his father. He breaks out of prison and finds a fabulous treasure in Italy, which he uses to create the false identity of the Count of Monte Cristo, so we can track down the bad guys one by one and destroy them. This concept gets adopted to American pulps. There's a basic formula. You get a hero who gets framed, probably for murder, sent to the death house, he escapes, and he then becomes a vigilante to go after the bad guys who framed him, and if he has time, he starts to go after the bad guys in general. And two examples of that are the bat created by Justin McCulley for the detective pulps, and in the Secret Six created by Robert J. Hogan, we had the leader of the Secret Six, a man named King, who, who went through that story line that I just outlined. Now, Robert J. Hogan also liked that concept of the Count of Monte Cristo so much that he applied it to the World War I aviation pulps and created the Red Falcon. The Red Falcon is an American ace who's framed by, for treason by German spies, so he breaks out of jail before he can be sent before a firing squad, and he becomes an independent soldier who seeks revenge against Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany. Now, the concept of avenging your father by killing off the guys who were responsible for his death one by one popped up in a series called Alias Mr. Death, by D.L. Champion. The hero is a wealthy socialite whose father is murdered by a crime syndicate, so the, the socialite then becomes a vigilante, Mr. Death, and in each story kills off a member of the crime syndicate. The most famous pulp hero who had to avenge his father's death was Doc Savage. And that happened in the first Doc Savage novel, The Man of Bronze, by Lester Dent. Now besides using the concept of avenging your father's death, the concept of a lost treasure also popped up in Doc Savage because while going after the mastermind who killed his father, Doc stumbles upon a Mayan treasure in Central America, which will use to fund all of his activities. This concept gets reworked in the Avengers six years after Doc Savage appeared, in which the father is now replaced by the hero's wife and daughter, and we still have the lost treasure that uh, is used to finance the hero's activities, but this time it's an Aztec treasure in Mexico. Another popular hero created by Dumas was the Chevalier de Mason Rouge. 
That translates into English as Knight of the Red House. He is a swashbuckling hero who in 1793 tries unsuccessfully to save Marie Antoinette from the guillotine. So we have two concepts here. A hero associated with the color red and rescuing people from the guillotine, and in the hand of a British writer named Baroness Orksey, that character is essentially rewritten as Sir Percy Blakeney, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Now a lot of concepts from French popular fiction first entered British literature and then they get, and through the filtering of British literature, they really influence American pulse. Chevalier de Mason Rouge is, is such an example. Scarlet Pimpernel now, in, in turn, influences Zorro and other pulp heroes. Now, Chevalier de Mason Rouge was so popular, it inspired a series of prequels known as the Marie Antoinette <coughs> series. The central cap, uh, historical event which, around which all these novels uh, 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 revolve is a crime committed in 1785, four years before the French Revolution broke out. A gang of swindlers used forged credentials to impersonate agents of Marie Antoinette, and they managed to steal, largely on credit, the most expensive necklace ever made. They were all arrested and put on trial, and during the trial they claimed that they were really working for Marie Antoinette, who was supposedly committing this swindle for some devious purpose of her own. Now that story was totally ridiculous, but the French public wasn't that smart back then, so they bought it hook, line, and sinker, and Marie Antoinette, who was then a pretty popular queen in France, suddenly became the most hated person in the nation. This was a major cause of the French Revolution four years later. Now, when they arrested that gang of swindlers, there was another swindler who used to hang out with them, and they picked him up, even though he had nothing to do with the crime and would eventually be found not guilty during the trial. His real name was Joseph Bosama, but he created the false identity of Count Alexander Cagliostro to swindle people by pretending to be an immortal sorcerer who could foretell the future. He also practiced hypnotism. After he was acquitted, he was exiled from France. Eventually, he ended up in Italy, where he was arrested for practicing witchcraft about the time the French Revolution broke out in 1789. And he spent six years in prison and eventually died in 1795. Now, Alexander Dumas decides to make him the secret architect of the French Revolution, even though he is at best a minor character in history. Alexander Dumas wrote a, first wrote a three-volume work about him called The Memoirs of a Physician, which was also known as Joseph Bassamo. But to totally confuse matters, the most common English edition available now is a two-volume abridged edition but the first volume is called Joseph Bosamo, and the second volume is called The Memoirs of a Physician. Now, Cagliostro, or Joseph Bosamo, <coughs> becomes a member of a secret society dedicated to destroying all the monarchies of Europe. In 1770, 19 years before the outbreak of the French Revolution, he is supposedly chosen to plant the seeds of revolution in France. He goes there, not in the Cagliostro identity yet, he uses the false identity of the Count de Fenex. And he tries to plot a, a revolution much earlier, but it fails and he's forced to flee the country. He then returns in a sequel called The Queen's Necklace, which is the fictionalization of the swindle I originally outlined. And in this version, Cagliostro has a much bigger role in the swindle, he effectively manipulates everybody involved to destroy the reputation of Marie Antoinette and plant the seeds of revolution. This novel was later made into a movie in 1949 starring Orson Welles as Cagliostro. That movie was called Black Magic. There were two more sequels to, uh, or two more sequels to these Cagliostro novels. 
The first one is called Ange for Two, The Taking of the Bastille. Cagliostro doesn't appear in that, so we're not going to discuss that at, at length. The second sequel was called The Countess de Charnay, and in that story, now Cagliostro was in prison during the early years of the French Revolution in the 1790s. He supposedly breaks out much in around 1790 and by faking his death in that prison. That's five years earlier than he actually is supposed to have died. He comes to France, helps invent the guillotine, and plants and causes the execution of uh, King Louis the Sixteenth, and that's the beginning of the Reign of Terror. He then leaves France for parts unknown, and we never learn what really happened to him in the imagination of Alexander Dumas. In real life, he died in prison. Now we have here a central core concept. Take a major historical event, in this case the French Revolution, and then make a mastermind behind it. I missed the slide. Just. Uh, take a master, mastermind behind it who's responsible for that world-shattering event. This first appears in British fiction, and two major master criminals are inspired by Cagliostro. One is Carl Peterson, the arch enemy of Bulldog Grumman. Carl Peterson uses the identity of a French count, the Count de Guy, to plot with Russian communist world revolution. The other master criminal is Sax Roma's Fu Manchu. Sax Roma was a big fan of Alexander Dumas. And just as Cagliostro was behind the French Revolution, Fu Manchu was supposedly behind the World Depression of 1929. He supposedly caused it by manufacturing synthetic gold from lead and manipulating world markets. There also was a novel called President Fu Manchu that was published in 1936 in which Fu Manchu has a femme fatale working for him named Lola Dumas. And she is supposedly a descendant of Alexander Dumas. And this was probably Sax Roma's acknowledgement that Fu Manchu owes a debt to Dumas' uh, fictionalization of Count Cagliostro. Now, this whole concept of a fictional mastermind causing a, a, a world-shattering event popped up in Doc Savage in many ways. In one novel called Devil on the Moon, the villain is the secret architect of Benito Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. In another novel called Poison Island, the villain is the secret architect of the 1934 Night of the Long Knives, in which Adolf Hitler killed off all his political enemies in Germany. Those villains were minions of dictators, but the ultimate manipulator of world events appears in The Screaming Man, a 1945 Doc Savage novel. He is Jonas Sohn. He is the ultimate villain in Doc Savage. He is a secret master of Hitler and Mussolini. He has created a mind control device which causes people to embrace fascism in Italy, Germany, and Japan. And he's the man responsible for World War II, according to Lester Dent. A similar villain with a mind control device pops up in The Angry Canary in a 1948 Doc Savage novel. And that villain lives in Pakistan and is using a mind control device to cause Muslims to hate Hindus and is supposedly responsible for all the riots that occurred after the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan. Another a character in French literature who was influenced by Cagliostro was Captain Nemo. Now, Captain Nemo was originally conceived by Jules Verne in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as a left-wing ideologue interested in world revolution. He is, in fact, using gold from the ocean floor found in lost treasures to fund a revolution in Crete against the Ottoman Empire. Now, Captain Nemo is a morally ambiguous character who, ha who is both a hero and a villain. Both of those sides of Captain Nemo influence Doc Savage. In Verne's novel, Nemo uses his submarine, the Nautilus, to, to explore the South Pole in, 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 in Antarctica. 
Doc Savage sort of goes in the opposite direction in the novel called The Polar Treasure from 1933. Doc uses a submarine called the Hell Diver to explore the Arctic. In Verne's novel, Nemo is destroying ships around the world, and everybody thinks this is the work of the sea monster. This evil side of Nemo inspires two Doc Savage novels. In one, the sea angel, the bad guys are using a submarine to create the illusion of the sea monster. In the other, the submarine mystery, the bad guys are a gang of pirates who are sinking ships with submarines and then looting them while they're, while they're Vessels are on the ocean floor. Now, since we're celebrating Edgar Rice Burroughs at uh, Pope Fest, we should point out that Byrne also wrote Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is about a scientist discovering dinosaurs underneath the Earth. This inspired Edgar Rice Burroughs to create Pellucidar, a lost land of dinosaurs at the Earth's core, and Pellucidar would be eventually visited by Tarzan. The next character from Dumont that influences the Popes is the Man in the Iron Mask. Now, you've probably seen a movie version of this. In the movie version, as in the book, the Man in the Iron Mask is Philippe, a supposedly secret twin brother of the tyrannical French King Louis XIV. In all the movie versions, Philippe overthrows his brother, assumes his identity, and rules France benevolently. This is not the book. In the book, belief is a dupe of a sinister conspiracy that wants to take over France by people who are just as bad as Louis XIV. <clears throat> he briefly replaces his brother on the throne after his brother gets kidnapped and imprisoned. D'Artagnan, the leader of the, uh, of the captain of the King's Musketeers, previously from the Three Musketeers, rescues Louis XIV, foils the conspiracy, and Philippe gets thrown into prison and condemned to wear an iron mask for the rest of his life. Not exactly the movie version you see. Since Philippe in the original book is a sympathetic villain, it's no surprise that a more malevolent villain was created based on him, and that was Stahl Mask, the man in the steel mask, from Robert J. Hogan's G8 and his battle aces. Stahl Mask is a disfigured German scientist, sort of an early forerunner of Marvel Comics' Dr. Doom. Now, the concept of the, of the mask came from Man in the Iron Mask. But where did the concept of disfigurement come from? From another French writer, Gaston LaRue, who created a character called the Phantom of the Opera in 1910. The Phantom of the Opera was a man born with a skeletal face, who creates a secret sanctuary for himself beneath the Paris Opera House. Now, I used a photo here of the Phantom of the Opera from a movie with Claude Rains, because that looked most like the way the character was depicted in the book. Now, you notice that the Phantom is wearing a hat and a cloak, like a famous pulp adventure. Well, that's not an accident, because the shadow, as originally conceived, had a lot of the Phantom of the Opera in him. You see here a, a drawing by the late, great Frank Hamilton of a disfigured shadow. Originally, the shadow was supposed to be a World War I pilot who crashed, was horribly disfigured, and then became a vigilante using disguises to mask his disfigurement, sort of like Sam Raimi's later character, Dark Man, and that's where Sam Raimi got the idea from, essentially. What happened was, was Walter Gibson was writing the series and he planted various hints that the shadow was disfigured. He, Gibson realized that the concept was somewhat disturbing and made he uh, repel readers, so he abandoned that whole idea. And when he eventually explained the shadow's true origin, you see no references to disfigurement. Other pulp heroes were similarly disfigured. One character was created by Paul Ernst, his name was C.K., and C.K. wears a plastic lifelike mask to disguise his, his facial disfigurement. He's a detective who solves mysteries. Perhaps the most famous uh, disfigured hero from the Pulse was a character named Sheridan Dune, 
who ironically was the backup feature for the shadow in, in the 1930s, late 1930s, was created by a writer named Steve Fisher. And besides appearing in stories in the Shadow magazine, he also appeared in two hardcover mystery novels that have recently been collected as a giant devil novel by uh, Age of Aces. Now, Gaston LaRue did more than just use the spigment in his novels. He created a character named Sherry Beebe who used the concept of plastic surgery around 1914. Sherry Beebe is a Monte Cristo type character who an evil arist aristocrat brains for murder and Sherry Beebe is sentenced to Devil's Island for life. On the way there, he escapes with a plastic surgeon tracks down the bad guy who uh, framed him and has the plastic surgeon give him the, the bad guy's face so he can assume his life and function in society. This whole concept of plastic surgery then enters the American Pulse. In Daredevil Aces, there was a series starting in 1932 by Donald E. Kehoe called The Vanished Legion in which a plastic surgeon teams up with a gang of American aviators and gives them new faces so they can spy on the Germans. Oh. The concept of plastic surgery also popped up in the, late, in, in the early 1940s in a series of novels about a character named Dr. Zhang. The character was originally created by E. Hoffman Price in the first novel and then the series was taken over over by W.T. Ballard and Robert Leslie Bellow. Now, Dr. Zing was an American who used who faces all in through plastic surgery to look Chinese. One of these novels, and I'm not going to tell you which one, you'll have to read it in the omnibus edition from Alta's Press, steals the whole plot of Sherry Beebe, but you only learn that at the end. Another novel which used plastic surgery was The King of Terror by Lester Den and Doc Savage. And Den essentially combined Sherry Beebe with Man in the Iron Mask. He has a conspiracy to replace the world leaders with doubles, but since they can't all have twin brothers, he, had, he uses plastic surgery to make the doubles. Now I want to deal with a very controversial novel here, written in the 1840s by a man named Eugene Sue. It is a literary atrocity which is both anti-Semitic and anti-Catholic, and since those aspects had nothing to do with American pulps, I'm not going to go into them at all. But somehow the plot of this novel ended up as an invention novel. The plot, the main plot of this novel involves a French family scattered over the world who have to be in Paris at a certain date and time to claim their share of a family fortune and the only way they can identify themselves is by showing a medallion. Now, Paul Arms, in 1941, rewrote that plot, set it during World War II. There's a family of financiers named Hagar. It's implied that they're probably Jewish. who are being persecuted by the fascist and communist regimes of Europe. So they've shifted all their wealth to the United States. And since none of these members of the family have seen each other for years. They're going to identify themselves with medallions as they meet in the United States to divide up the wealth. Of course, a criminal gang discovers this and tries to steal all the medallions so they can claim the secret store of wealth. Now, a more respectable French writer than Eugene Sue was Honor de Balzac. He created a master criminal called Voltron, now, Voltron appeared in three novels. We're going to discuss one of them. It's called Lost Illusions. Voltron only plays a small role in this novel at the end. The main character in Lost Illusions is a man named Lucien, who was a young man of a poor background from the French provinces, decides to go to Paris to make his fortune. He's pretty successful for a while. He's got a great girlfriend. He's got all this money. He's doing wonderful. Then everything falls apart, he loses his girlfriend, he loses his money, and he decides to kill himself by drowning himself in a river. Voltron learns about it. Voltron prevents him from committing suicide 
and makes the following deal. He'll give him a purpose in life, provided he becomes his agent in his criminal schemes. And the next novel in the series, Scenes from a Courtesan's Life, tells you how that partnership works out. Now, if that Faustian bargain sounds a little familiar to you, you remember the opening scene of the first Shadow novel by Walter Gibson, in which a man called, named Harry Vincent comes from Michigan to New York. He's unlucky in love and unlucky in finance, and is so disturbed he's going to commit suicide by throwing himself off a bridge, but he's stopped by the Shadow, who then makes the same deal that Voltron made with Lucian, and the shadow be and Harry Vincent becomes the shadow's agent, except instead of working for a master criminal, he's working for a, a cloaked vigilante. Another French writer who was very important in mystery fiction was Paul Favard. Now, his he created a, a group of characters called the Black Coast, who were probably the first multinational crime syndicate in popular fiction. The novels were first appeared in the 1850s. Now, they've only recently been translated into English. So they had no influence on the American pulps, but they would influence another French writer who we will discuss momentarily, who did influence American pulps. Now, on the right side of the screen, you'll see on the cover of a recent English translation of a Black Coats novel, a young man holding a knife who looks kind of thin. His name is Lecoq. L-E-C-O-Q, and he's a master criminal who infiltrates the French police and then frames other people for his crimes. Baval had a secretary named Emil Gaborio, and Emil Gaborio decided to write mystery novels on his own, but instead of focusing on criminals, he was going to focus on the detective for the French police. He borrowed the name Lecoq. There's no overt connection between the two Lecoqs. This Lecoq, Gaborio's Lecoq, instead of being a criminal, is really an honest detective who uses disguises and inductive reasoning to solve crimes. He was a major influence on both Nick Carter in the United States and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. If you read the first Holmes novel, A Study in Scarlet, you may remember a conversation that goes like this. Dr. Watson asks Holmes, do you think you're as good a detective as Lecoq? And Holmes says, Lecoq was the miserable bungler, and I'm a better detective. But Lecoq did more than influence Sherlock Holmes. He also influenced Professor Moriarty, the archenemy of Sherlock Holmes. In a book called The Slaves of Paris, Lecoq battles his, the most dangerous criminal he ever faced, Baptiste Mascarat. Masquerade is a former mathematics tutor who dominates the underworld of Paris. Moriarty was a mathematics professor. But there was another villain from Sherlock Holmes who was also influenced by Masquerade. The title character of Sir Robert Conan Doyle's <coughs> The Adventure of Charles Augustus Middleton is a master blackmailer. Now, Masquerade's modus operandi was to bribe servants from, for wealthy people and have the servants steal the letters of their employers and then give them the masquerade so we could use them for blackmail. Charles Middleton uses the same modus operandi. This whole concept of massive blackmail rings pops up in the American pulp, <laughs> such as the shadow novel The Blackmail Ring from 1932. Why, Faval's crime novels were not translated into English. He wrote several swashbucklers that were. The most famous of this is a novel called Le Bossur, which literally means The Hunchback. It was translated into English around 1860 as The Hunchback of Paris. You see here scenes from a movie version made in 1960 with John Moray as the hero. The hero's name is Henri Lagardère. In real life, he's a handsome-looking guy, but he learns about a villain who is trying to mani manipulate the stock market and swindle everybody. So he creates a false identity to infiltrate the bad guy's gang, 
and that is of a hunchback named Jonas. The bad guy also has an elite group of assassins working for him, so Lagadere decides to kill off those guys one by one by challenging the sword fights. Lagadere has a neat trick that he uses in a sword fight. He has this incredible thrust where he stabs his opponent in the forehead. So there are all these corpses appearing in Paris with red marks on their foreheads. This idea was not original to Baval. He borrowed it from Balzac's. Voltron, the master criminal who I discussed earlier, knew the same methodology of stabbing somebody in the forehead during a sword fight. Now let's look at this concept for a moment. We have a hero who poses as a hunchback and stabs people and, and leaves corpses in his wake with red marks on their foreheads. <coughs> was there any American pulp like that? Yes, there was. The spider. Now the spider was always shown some wearing vampire-like makeup. But it wasn't sometimes apparent from the illustrations, but it was mentioned in the text. It was also wearing a fake hump to look like a hunchback. He also killed criminals and marked their foreheads with, the, with, the, with his ring, which created a spider-like image. Oh, let me just go back. Um, now, there were two writers here who... Uh, responsible for fashioning the spider. The first was R.T.M. Scott, and he came up with the idea of the, of the red marks on the forehead. He might have been influenced by Paval or by Balzac, who's the more famous writer, into coming up with that idea. Now, Norval Page then took over the series, and he came up with the Hunter of the Skies. That is probably a coincidence because it was common in literature and movies back then to have characters called the spider who were also hunchbacks. For example, in 1929 there was a movie version of A. Merritt's classic pulp novel, Seven Footprints to Satan, in which the screenwriter added a hunchback villain called the spider. But while the spider may also have been influenced by Baval, so may have been another pulp hero, Johnston McCulley's Zorro. Now, in most of the TV versions and movie versions that you've seen, Zorro only draws the sign of the Z on the clothes of the bad guys opposing him. But in his original conception, he would mark the flesh of the bad guys, either on the cheek, the forehead, sometimes on the side of the hand. And here you see a still from the original Zorro movie, The Mark of Zorro from 1929, with Douglas Fairbanks Sr. Now there is a direct connection between Zorro and uh, Lobosura, which surfaced many years later. And we have to go over the plot to establish that. The plot of the novel involves a, the greatest swordsman in France, who's the Duke of Nevers, and he is the one who originates the neat trick of stabbing people in the forehead. He has a lovely wife and a hateful enemy who has a romantic obsession with the wife. The bad guy kills the duke and imprisons the wife in a nunnery for about 20 years. Now this loving couple had a daughter and somebody has to raise her. Well, the Duke had a close friend named who's Henri Lagadere, who he's taught the, tr the trick of stabbing people in the forehead. And Lagadere takes the young baby and raises it as his own daughter. Eventually, the mother breaks out of the nunnery, forms an alliance with Lagadere, and together they expose the bad guy and reveal the true birthright to the daughter, but once she discovers Lagadere is not her father, realizes that she's romantically in love with him, she marries him even though he's 20 years older, and he becomes the new Duke of Nevers. Now there's a little flaw in this storyline, which is probably why it was never directly ever made into an American movie. It's kind of weird that the hero has been pretending to be the father for about 20 years, 
And now he becomes the romantic lover of the daughter. It's not technically incestuous, but it's a little disturbing. <laughs> Therefore, this plot would have to be reworked if it was ever to become an American movie, at least unofficially. And it did become an American movie in 1998. It became The Mark of Zorro with Antonio Banderas, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and Anthony Hopkins. Here's how the plot got reworked. Instead of being a French, the greatest swordsman in France, the nobleman is now the greatest swordsman in California, Don Diego Vega, alias Zorro. As in the French version, he has a loving wife and an enemy who loves the wife. Now, in the original French story, the bad guy killed the nobleman and, and imprisoned the wife. He does the opposite in this version. He kills the wife and imprisons the nobleman. Now, as in both in the original French story, the couple has a young infant daughter. Somebody has to raise her. You don't want to make it the rogue, because that causes all sorts of complications that I mentioned before. So you have the bad guy raise the daughter. And if anybody sees something incestuous in that relationship, it's OK, because it's, we're dealing with a bad guy here. Now, Lagadier in the original novel was a bit of a, a rogue. I didn't mention that earlier. He was a sort of a mercenary for hire who was a master swordsman. So what, what happens in this version is, while the mother in the original French novel broke out of the nunnery, the father breaks out of the prison. He now meets the rogue 20 years early, 20 years later than their counterparts did in the French novel, now trains him to be a swordsman. <coughs> Instead of training him to stab people in the forehead, he trains him to draw Z's all over his enemies. And the hero, can now be only a little older than the daughter, so it's okay if they become romantic uh, partners. And an alliance of one of the parents of the daughter and a roguish <laughs> swordsman defeats the bad guy and reveals the true birthright to the daughter. And in the French version, the hero is rewarded by becoming the new Duke of Never. In this version, the hero is rewarded becoming the new Zorro. But Le Bossu may also influence another pulp writer, Edgar Rice Burroughs. In 1911, he wrote a no novel called The Outlaw of Torn. It wasn't uh, published in book form until 1927. This, this is a swashbuckler set in 13th century England. It involves the heir to the British throne being kidnapped by a master swordsman and raised as his own son. And the, the son is trained to become an outlaw who after he defeats people and kill, fatally defeats people in duels, scratches the initials NT into their forehead because he's known as Norman of Torn. So we see two concepts from Lobo Sewer here. First of all, we have a master swordsman raising a child who's not his own. And secondly, we have Losers in duels being marked in the forehead. Now, besides being possibly influenced by Le Bossur, a little interesting question is raised here. Could RTM Scott have gotten the idea for the spider marking his victims from Edgar Rice Burroughs? Another popular character in French literature really existed. His name was Cyrano de Bergerac, and he was fictionalized in a French play around 1897 by Edmund Rostat. A, he was a swordsman with a large nose who recited poetry where he fatally stabbed people to death or in sword fights. An American writer named Anatole Feldman created a character called Big Nose Serrano who fatally shoots rival gangsters why singing songs. <laughs> now, after the Count of Monte Cristo, probably the most influential character on American pulp heroes was Arsan Lupin, who was created by Maurice LeBlanc in 1905. Lupin is a master thief who steals from the rich and gives to himself. But since he doesn't normally murder anybody, He's generally presented as somewhat roguish and sympathetic. 
His arch enemy, by the way, is Countess Cagliostro, and she's the great granddaughter of Count Cagliostro. And the version of Cagliostro used here is not the historical version, it's the Duma version. <clears throat> Walter Gibson, the creator of The Shadow, was a big fan of this series. He, he, said, he admitted that in many interviews. Now, the central core concept of Lupin, when he has to create, he, was a, he had many false identities, as many false identities as The Shadow. He normally created those identities by finding about some Frenchman who died abroad in like North Africa or Indochina, getting a hold of his papers, and then assuming his identity back in France. So Arsene Lupin impersonates Frenchmen who died abroad. Now in the shadow we have almost the same concept. We have the shadow impersonating Lamont Cranston, an American who lives abroad. A novel about Austin Lupin that influenced Walter Gibson was The Teeth of the Tiger. In this story, Austin Lupin assumes the false identity of Luis Perenna and joins the French Foreign Legion. By serving in North Africa, he builds up a phenomenal war record and then returns to France to solve mysteries. In a classic 1935 novel, Walter Gibson creates the only detective in the Shadow series who is the equal of the Shadow in more ways than one. That man's name is M.T. and Robeck. And Robeck has a background just like Arsene Lupin's false identity. Robeck joins the French Foreign Legion, builds up a phenomenal record, and then returns back to France and solves crimes. After Arsene Lupin, more murderous master criminals became popular in France. In 1909, there was a character called Zingomar, created by a writer named Leon Salzi. Now, none of these stories were ever translated into, into English. They've all gone out of print in France. I have not been able to see any of them. Apparently, he leaves a Z at the site of his, at, at, at the site of his crimes. <clears throat> He would probably be totally forgotten if not for the fact that they made three movie serials about him, all of which were shown in the United States. So they could have been seen by Johnson McCulley when he created Zorro, and maybe, maybe McCulley got the idea for the sign of the Z from Zigomar. And these serials were very marketable in America because the film company that had the rights to Zigomar also had purchased the rights to a popular American detective named Nick Carter. And rather than have Zygomar fight the forgettable detective who was always fooling in the novels about him, they decided to have Zygomar fight Nick Carter in two of the serials. Those serials were called Zygomar and Zygomar versus Nick Carter. A more popular French murderous master criminal was Fatomas, who first appeared in 1911 in a series of inexpensive novels that were published on a monthly basis. They were almost a pulp miniseries, 32 novels in all in the first series. He died at the end of the, those, that series around 1913, and he was revived after World War I for 11 more novels. <coughs> Fatomas uh, you see here a picture of Fenomas from the first novel, in an image that became very popular. He's wearing formal dress. He's not wearing any gloves, if you noticed, in this drawing. And that image was actually borrowed from the first edition of the Phantom of the Opera in 1910. Now, what's interesting is neither Fenomas or the Phantom of the Opera ever dressed like that in the stories written about them. But a talented film director named Louis Fillard made five movies about Fanomas that were shown all over the world, including the United States. A movie poster was made from that cover, which you see here, over on the right. And you notice that Fanomas now is wearing white gloves. And that movie poster seems to have been known to 
the publishers of Standard Magazine, because in the 30s they created a character called the Phantom Detective, who besides having a similarity of imagery and a name, Phantom Detective, Phantom Moss, also has an interesting coincidence that in the first novel about him is The Emperor of Death, while Phantom Moss in, in the novels about him was called The Emperor of Crime. Now, Phantom Moss in the pulp stories and in the movies about him really look like this. A man in a black hood and black tights. Now, he was an incredibly murderous criminal who would always terrorize Paris and kill probably on average 10 to 20 people per novel, except on a really evil day where, where he kills about 100 people per novel. And so we began to have the concept of a man terrorizing a major city, killing a lot of people. That first pops up in an unusual shadow novel called The Black Master, written by Walter Gibson in 1933 in which the shadow battles the first master criminal who he considers his equal, a character called the Black Master, who wears a black hood and a robe instead of tights, has a mysterious background in Europe, and who terrorizes New York by planting bombs all over the city. That was probably influ influenced by Phantom Moss. There's a more obvious instance of influenced by Phantom Moss in a novel called The Grove of Doom from 1933. In that novel, the villain has a mysterious assassin working for him who's an incredible secret that I'm not going to reveal. But Phantom Moss had an assassin with the same secret working for him in the second Phantom Moss, in the Phantom Moss novel, The Exploits of Jew, that was made into one of the Phantom Moss movies. Now, Concept, an idea pops up here, the, the central plot of the, all the spider novels in which a master criminal kills thousands of people from New York, stem from Phantom Moss killing scores of people in Paris. Interestingly enough, the first novel in that vein written by Noble Page in 1934, Wings yeah. of the Black Death, has a similarity to the eighth Phantom Moss novel, The Daughter of Phantom Moss. In Wings of the Black Death, the spider's adversary spreads bubonic plague throughout New York. In Daughter of Phantom Moss, the villain spreads bubonic plague on an ocean liner. However, Daughter of Phantom Moss was only recently translated by Mark Steele into English, so it's probably just a coincidence that those two novels have the same plot, unless Noble Page knew French. Now, Louis Fouillard, who had made the popular films of Phantom Moss before World War I, lost the film rights during, during the war. So he decided to make a sort of rip-off group of villains called the Vampires, who appeared in a popular serial. They all dressed like Phantom Moss in one form or another. Most of them wore the black hooded tights. You can see a character in the corner who dressed like the famous movie poster. And the most famous member of this criminal gang was a woman named Irma Vep, anagram for vampire, who wears black tights and is a cat burglar. This movie this series was apparently seen by Seabury Quinn, the creator of the most popular character in Weird Tales, Jules de Grand Don, who has even been translated into French. In a, in a 1937 story called Children of the Bat, Jules de Grandin, who normally battles supernatural menaces, just battles a group of weird criminals who use vampire paraphernalia in their crimes. They're a gang in Mexico that called the Children of the Bat. They wear black hooded and robes, but their leader is a woman who wears a skin-tight black costume. Another example of an influence of a French novel on a Jules de Grandin story is Seabury Quinn's 1935 story, Hands of the Dead. It was influenced by a popular French novel by Maurice Renard, written in 1920, called The Hands of Orlock. The plot of that novel is it's about a pianist who loses his hands in a railway accident, and a surgeon grafts on his, on his arms the hands of a man recently guillotined. The pianist recovers from the accident, 
and, believe, and begins to believe that the ghost of the murderer is trying to possess him. This was made in, in a popular 1924 movie called Hands of Orlock, starring Conrad Veidt, the author best known for, I mean, the actor best known for playing the villain in Casablanca. That was the only movie version made at the time when Quinn wrote the story. Besides Seabury Quinn, H.P. Lovecraft also was influenced by French literature. Now, Lovecraft, besides writing stories under his own name, sometimes revised stories for other authors. In 1927, he was hired by a writer named Adolf de Castro to take a couple of science fiction stories that de Castro had written in the 1890s and revise them into supernatural stories to be published in an altered version in Weird Tales. One such story was called, in its new title, The Last Test, and appeared in the 1929 issue of Weird Tales. Now, in the original story, the main villain was a mad scientist who was creating plagues in his laboratory. Lovecraft decides to add to the plot a resurrected sorcerer from Atlantis whose mummy was discovered by the mad scientist. Now, since it would be difficult for the mad scientist to discover a mummy on the ocean floor, since that's where Atlantis is, Lovecraft had to put it in a lost colony of Atlantis. He put it in the Hogar Mountains of North Africa. That idea came from a novel which Lovecraft definitely read because he mentions it in the 1927 letter to Clark Ashton Smith. The novel was called Atlantida by Pierre Benoit. It involves a lost colony of Atlantis in the Hogar Mountains, ruled by a queen who kills her lovers. Now, the, the kingdom was called Al Hagar. This sounds a little familiar. Edgar Rice Burroughs created a lost civilization in Africa that was a colony of Atlantis, that was originally a colony of Atlantis called Ophar, and it was ruled by an evil queen who was trying to kill the man who she loved, Tarzan. However, Opal was created six years earlier than Al Hagar in The Return of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. So the issue arises here, did Burroughs influence Benoit? Probably not because Return of Tarzan wasn't translated into French until 1938. Now I'm going to discuss the last character in this presentation that I have to deal with. His name is Judix, which means Judge in Latin, he dresses like the shadow, he's a vigilante like the shadow, but he popped up in 1917 in movie serials, two movie serials. The second one was made around 1918, 1919. The first serial was called Judix, the second serial was called Judix's New Mission. The first Judix serial exists in its entirety. And it's five and a half hours, and you can buy it on DVD. The second Judic serial apparently has the last three chapters of, the, of, of its 12 <coughs> chapters missing. And it's only been shown at film festivals in France, as far as I can tell. Now, Louis Fouillard wrote the screenplays for these novels with a popular French writer named Arthur Benet. And he decided. Burnett is actually his name. Arthur Burnett decided to write two novelizations based on these serials. Both novelizations existed in France. I translated the first of them into English. It's a much superior story because he had characters, backgrounds, and there's so much you can do in a silent movie as far as explanation and effect. Uh, this book is published by Black Belt Press. You can buy it on Amazon or possibly from a dealer here. And currently I'm translating the second serial, which, would, which will be uh, the novelization of the second serial, which will be printed under the title The Return of Judix. Now, we have an overall question here of similarity to Shadow. I don't think Walter Gibson was influenced at all by this. And I'll explain later why. But there was another shadow writer named Theodore Tinsley who also used the pseudonym of Maxwell Grant to write shadow novels. And his most famous work, The Prince of Evil, which introduced a recurring villain named Benedict Stark, has marked similarities to Judix. 
And the original plot of Unix is sort of like the Count of Monte Cristo. An evil banker named Favreau causes Judix's father to commit suicide and tries to impoverish his Judix's family, but the family actually has a secret gold mine in Africa, so they survive. Judix, who's then about 14 at the time, is asked by his mother to swear an oath of vengeance. When he's about 30, he becomes a mass vigilante called Judix. His real name was Jacques de Tremousse and he takes vengeance on the banker. Now when the Prince of Evil, Benedict Stark, is an evil financier who destroys anybody who ticks him off, and he decides to destroy a, a family by causing the father to commit suicide and impoverishing the rest of the family. That's the first similarity. The second similarity is that when Judix takes revenge on the banker, he imprisons him, he kidnaps him, and imprisons him in a futuristic torture chamber where he uses special side effects to drive him nuts. Since this is a silent film, he can't use sound effects. Now, in The Prince of Evil, the Shadow doesn't kidnap Benedict Stark, but he kidnaps a guy who works for Benedict Stark, and he uses sight and sound in a futuristic torture chamber that didn't exist in the works of Paul Gibson to extort information from the bad guy. Is there a possible explanation for these similarities other than Theodore Tinsley having seen the movie? Well, first of all, let's examine the question of whether Tinsley could have seen the movie. Uh, the movie apparently was never shown in the United States. That was established with the help of Anthony Tolan. But even though all of the yards, other serials seem to have been shown in the United States. But C.L.R. Tinsley was a soldier in France in the latter years of World War I, and he, that was when Judix was released, so he could have seen the movie in France. But the other explanation is that there was a common literary ancestor for both the villains of Judix and the Prince of Evil, and that villain is a character named Baron Dangwall, as seen here as played by the late British actor Donald Plaisance. Baron Danglars, in the Count of Monte Cristo, was one of the four men who framed Edmund Dantes. Monte Cristo kidnaps him and imprisons him in a prison cell and tr tries to starve him to death unless he signs away his fortune, which he eventually does. So that's where the whole idea of imprisoning an evil banker came from. So maybe. So, you know, Tinsley got it from the same source, and just because he loved very violent stories, ended up with something similar to the Judix movie. Now, another, you have to address the issue of why Walter Gibson's work is so similar. We saw earlier that Gibson was influenced by The Phantom of the Opera. Now, the co-author of the screenplay, Arthur Burnett, was a close friend of Gaston LaRue. Now, in the original Phantom of the Opera novel, not in any of the film versions, there's a dangling plot angle that is never resolved. It was a mysterious man who is not the Phantom of the Opera, who is also living under the Paris Opera House, who is called the Shadow and the Man in the, in the Felt Hat. And this man is apparently either a spy or a vigilante, but it's never established which. And this was probably intended as a setup for a sequel by Gaston LaRue, but he never got around to writing it. And in the Judix novelization, Judix is referred to as the man in the felt hat. In both the serial and no in the novelization, he's referred to as the mysterious shadow. I think Burnett got the idea for Judix from the Phantom of the Opera. Now, since there was an obvious connection here, I wrote a prequel series of short stories published by Wildcat Books, which explains who the man in the felt hat really is, and is also a prequel to Judix, because the man in the felt hat meets the parents of Judix in the course of the, the short stories. There were two remakes of Judix, one in 1934. I haven't seen it, but based on the movie poster, they seem to have gotten rid of Judix's hat. 
in uh, 1963, they made a remake which is available on DVD from Amazon, which is uh, only 90 minutes long and it's a more condensed version of the story, but it's probably more entertaining to a modern viewer than the original silent serial. Ironically, Judix in that serial is played by Shanning Pollock, an American magician who was a close friend of Walter Gibson. Hmm. Now, in the 1940s, a French publisher got a hold of comic strips that uh, Walter Gibson had written about the shadow for newspapers and decided to publish them in France. <laughs> But since nobody had heard of the Shadow, he decided to rename the character Judix since they look alike. But when he changed that, he didn't change anything else. So Judix, instead of being Dr. Tremus and living in Paris, is now Lamont Cranston living in New York. Furthermore, he has Harry Vincent working for him. And furthermore, he's battling Shiwan Khan, which is somewhat ironic, because Shiwan Khan is an evil hypnotist, and the second Judix serial as Judix battling an evil German hypnotist. Now on the final note, there's another irony here. We saw earlier that Phantomas probably influenced the Phantom Detective. We saw earlier that that Phantomas was a character popularized by Louis Fouillard. We saw earlier that Theodore Tinsley may have borrowed from Judix. Well, it looks like Phantomas suddenly became an enemy of the Shadow. Because in 1964, they decided to make a new movie version of Phantom Moss, and they said, we got to throw out the black hood and the black tights, because that's kind of old hat. Let's create a radically new image for him. So they have him dress in a black suit and wear this incredibly blue mask, in which it's bald, you see the ears emphasized, you see the nose emphasized, you see the mouth emphasized. Ironically, it closely resembles a 1942 shadow villain created by Theodore Tinsley called Blueface. I don't know if this is coincidence or not. And that ends the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. We'll take just a five minute break or so. Since we're running late, we're not going to have questions, but Rick will be available outside if you want to ask him some questions about the presentation. We'll just give you a few minutes.